I think uh, perhaps my uh, literary ability, because some some folks thought I founded Al-Anon. No, I found Al-Anon, <laughs> oh. and that, that was a saving a saving grace. I'd like to start with a prayer from our prayer book. The, for, uh, the, poor, the prayer for the victims of addiction, which is uh, in the back of our prayer book on page 231. O oh, blessed Lord, you ministered to all who came to you. Look with compassion upon all who, through addiction, have lost their health. Restore to them the assurance of your unfailing mercy. Remove from them the fears that beset them. Strengthen them in the work of their recovery. And to those who care for them, give patient understanding and persevering love. Amen. Amen. I said that prayer every Sunday in church. For most of my life, Dad was an alcoholic. Now he's gone. He's deceased now. Uh, but his and, and I come from a long, a long line of alcoholics. Uh, all very high functioning, all, all very uh, respectable people, uh, but who had lost their ability through addiction to to really function as I wish I would have known they could. Uh, so that. Uh, so my own story around that is I had a good friend in high school whose mother was an alcoholic. And uh, if you know anything about addiction, one of the things that happens uh, is it's about secret keeping. And so that we were even able to find each other in a place uh, was, was, a, was a miracle in and of itself. And so she and I started driving a couple of towns over on Thursday this we could I guess we must have been 16 because we could drive uh, to attend Alateen. And I don't even remember how we knew. I don't even know anything about it. But we walked into those rooms, and you'll hear many people say this. We walked into those rooms and we felt like we were home. And well, I didn't go for long, a year and a half, maybe. Um I was on the beginning of a journey. It's hard for me uh, often in my life. I really think there's a beginning and a middle and an end of everything. And certainly once I mastered 12 steps, then I was finished. Wrong. <laughs> Sounds so, good. <laughs> yeah, it was a good thing. Uh, but uh, later in uh, my 20s, I went to adult children of alcohol where there were people the same age I was or older who were still under the influence, if you will, of having an alcoholic parent or living in an alcoholic system. So, you know, that over, that helped because I could hear that people were still struggling with the same things that I've been struggling with and I wasn't alone there either. And again, I thought, okay. And then later, I went to co-dependence anonymous <laughs> when my marriage was, yeah, right? But I couldn't, when I could no longer use those coping skills and control, mostly they're not really coping, they were controlling. And that was starting to have an impact on my own family. And later, our oldest son, a heroin addict, and another. That treatment has been sober for eight years. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But Todd and I found that instead of taking ballroom dancing, we found ourselves at al <laughs> on Wednesday nights. And thank God for that. Because we could see our part. And I'm not saying this is a shaming way, but we began to see our part in Ned's addiction. And we had our own addictive behaviors. And then, you know, um, so, so has AA been important to me? Have the 12 steps been important to me? Yes. And it's not just accidental. I'm going to give you a little history. You can read all that stuff I gave you. It's all very interesting. Um, but there's this intersection between AA and um, the 12 steps. No, that's the one I And the Episcopal Church. That's what I meant to say. So, but what, if you know anything about AA, you know that it's attributed to uh, Dr. And they're from my hometown, Akron, Ohio. 
Um, I don't know if there's a predominance of alcoholism in Ohio or not, but now that I've wondered that myself. Um, what's the connection? In the 20s, I mean the 1920s, there was a group called the Oxford Group in England. They began to get together to talk about what was wrong with the church. What could the church do better? How could the church begin to examine itself? And it came up with these. I'm going to show you a little video in a minute. Or well, maybe I'm not. I don't know how that works. <laughs> a guy named uh, Frank Buckman, who was a Lutheran, who's having a crisis of faith. A lot of anger. He's carrying a tremendous amount of anger. And while he was in London or in England trying to, on a sabbatical, he found the Oxford group and he, he discovered that his anger was actually keeping him from God. Oxford praying, where they would first admit that they were powerless. Those blocks, those what AA has later called defects of character, right? Those are steps four, five, six, and seven, all have to do with seeing what's in our hearts, confessing them to someone else, and then deciding to lead a new way. So that was the basis of the Oxford group's work. But they were doing it in the context of the church. And then that movement spread across the United States. And in fact, is responsible for these prayer books. It took, it took about 40 years, but eventually we got a new prayer book from some of those folks and some other ways of being and doing stuff. A lot of things, a lot of liturgical changes. Yes, some of those also came from Rome, but it was happening at the same time. Bob was actually a raging alcoholic and he was losing his practice, had lost his practice, his privileges at uh, two hospitals in Akron. Uh, started to hear about this Oxford group and somehow what we might call coincidence or some people call synchronicity or I just call that God. Yes, you know, that just, that's just God. And so, those two got together, or with Bill, and they began to see that there was a way through dependency in a different on their own. Neither of those so and then Bob was also responsible for the beginning of the movement to talk about alcoholism and addiction as a disease. Not as, yes, as both a moral issue, but beyond a moral issue. We have a personal part in this, absolutely. But until we're able to turn our lives over to God, My son struggled, and I hate to tell this story, but I hope you'd be all right with it. I did ask him. Um, my son struggled with this idea. Not this race as a Christian, went to EYE, was on the diocesan council for youth, did all the things that good Episcopal boys whose mothers make them do things do. <laughs> um, and so he um, he had a difficult time with understanding who God is. First two steps. reluctant, but I think that's mostly addiction. Strong, so I think that's mostly that. So he began to see the 12 steps as his higher power. The steps themselves. Or not only in body, mind, spirit, Um, Christian, but he's been restored to understanding that there is a higher power, God, who cares and loves. 
Like it is, you know, immense. Totally smart enough to understand that the things he was doing were harming him. But this is that the surrender that is so hard for us because we're very capable people. Everyone's very, very. So that's the hardest part. That's why it's the first step. Go back and start again. One of the other things about AA and 12 step groups, there shouldn't be any sense of shame. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There's to be a fellowship of people in anonymity. Next permission to tell this story. So in anonymity, why they use their first name only. But we don't say, how are you doing? What step are you on? Your sponsor might ask you that. That's the work you do one-on-one -on -one with someone else. That's part of the 11th and 12th steps, right? Giving back to your community. Service is important work here. We're part of AA. That's where one and this, what I like to call the circle of the 12 steps. That's where one and 12 come back together. When we agree to lead someone else, So there's um, this idea of service is important because we take what we have learned and we other, but one of the other things that's important to me about 12 step work is that it is by attraction. Coercion never works. It didn't work with me. Lighting bottles, it didn't, that didn't help. Finding my dad at dinner in front of my grandparents, that did not help. I think of all the horrible things I did. Change this pattern of behavior. None of those things. Questions do you have? What else would you like to know? I, I think I'd like to also share. So another key part of 12-step work is the serenity prayer. But its origins, Reinhold Niebuhr uh, wrote a prayer, which he probably borrowed from some other sources because all of us who do church work, <laughs> we all steal from everyone else. <laughs> That's just what we do. We try to give attribution, that's important, um, but we borrow, liberal. And because we're all in the same suit. I mean, look, the words are floating around, it's all there. I expect that's true if you're an engineer or you're a lawyer or whatever you do. Lawyers steal, but everybody else borrows. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting next to the lawyer. Oh, what do I have? So you've been to the 12th century. <laughs> so the serenity prayer, God grant me the serenity to change the things I can, the courage to accept the things I cannot change. And the prayer goes on from there. And there's other there's other things. Actually, even knows how it got absorbed into AA. Um, but it did. And now most meetings begin or end with the serenity prayer. Some begin and end with the Lord's Prayer. Some use other things, depending on where they are. So as you know, there are 12 step groups for everything you can imagine. And many kinds of substances over it and this one as well. Okay. Yeah, anything that... Right, you know that behavior gets, a rut, apparently, you know, a rut gets in our uh, way our synopsis work. And so, you know, that's, that's what feels most comfortable to us. Uh, 
can stop drinking without AA? I'm sure they do. Mm -hmm. Can people stop using? Can people stop eating? Can people stop smoking? Yeah. I'm just saying from my own personal experience. Fabulous preacher, order. At a church in New York City. I think it's a good shepherd. Uh, and he went on to really be a proponent of AA. He had been a drunk. And uh, if you ever get a chance to do a YouTube or Google that, he did their, I think AA was maybe celebrating their 30th anniversary or something, a big thing in St. Louis, and he gave the opening remarks. And that's just a fabulous, fabulous own journey plus. Who are you talking about? Sam, Sam. Schumann. Oh, this man. You got a picture of him there. Yeah, I didn't hear your son. That's okay. So he's in our Holy Men and Holy Women, which is our kind of uh, hagiography, right, of holy, holy people that the church celebrates. Do you need to go to copy? There's one in the hallway. No, don't go. No, 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 no. I'll get it on the There you go. Um, so again, this intersection between, and how many Episcopal churches do you know who have AA? I mean, we did up until last week. I don't know. Is that right? Mm -hmm. They don't make you Not right now. They just decided the library was more conducive to what they needed to do. Right, we do have that. And you can go almost anywhere around the world to a church and, and find an AA meeting. Or 10. Or every day of the week sometimes. Every day of the week. Whatever it takes. I assume that it's bigger than just the Christmas church. Oh. There's a reason that there's a predominance of AA groups meeting in Christmas churches. Well, because we drink openly, a lot, a lot of people, and so, and we're social, and we, we do occupy some strata of uh, American life, right? Economic life, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and some denominations are more closed about drinking. And some just that, don't talk about. It. They go out of the way not to talk about it. Baptists may Baptist. go to tailgate parties, but they wouldn't talk about drinking with their friends on Sunday. I don't think some Baptists have their ritual of football games. Right. I think the difficult thing <laughs> by being here, everybody, all the coolest people were the biggest drinkers. <laughs> You know, the people that would go out and get drunk, you'd think they were the most fun, and you'd have these parties, and, you know, the teetotalers were kind of the nerds and not much fun, and the more you drank, the more fun you were, and that was just part of the culture, and to stop and wrecking, I don't think, maybe because we're older, we don't drink as much anymore, uh, and seeing people just flat out drunk at parties, you don't think they're as cool as you used to be. <laughs> They weren't uptight, that's for sure, right? Yeah. So I, I think that came down. I remember yeah. watching movies like I think it was like a lot wine and roses. Is it wine and roses? Oh my god. I mean, you know, that just right, right. And that's kind of you know, and then there was the temperance movement. When, when, when there was prohibition. I mean, so there was definitely a divide about people who drank were morally corrupt. If the temperance movement said this, they showed us in, in, in their, in their uh, media campaign, if you want to call it that, of the last century and a half, right, were pictures of children who were being fed and wives that were beaten and people who were thrown out on the streets and the very, very, very negative impacts of all that. Right? Yeah, and it was. 
that did happen, but that wasn't a reason to stop. And it didn't, it didn't say that this was also occurring in a lot of other homes. Where everything that was as it was was as it was, right? We didn't have to all be hooked in. Right? That's really, if you think about that story, that's the idea of a, of a town girl. Children. That was the stereotype. What other things does this bring up for y'all? And so, so I would say that there are 12 steps. There are 12 principles that go along with the 12 steps. And um, so and I did write about those. And those principles are really more for, as we get further on, because you'll notice those words are so familiar. It's kind of a Christian walk as well. I've also given you, of course, a bibliography because in case you have interest. So the principles are on the back of page one. Honesty. I learned to look truthfully at other things that I'm powerless over yet make my life unmanageable. It takes honest vision to fully understand there's a problem and that I have no way to solve it myself. Number two, hope. I came to believe I can have a relationship with God who can do things for me that I can't. Or to sanity. You know that definition of insanity doing the same things over and over again and expecting a different outcome or result. Yes. <laughs> right. Yep. Faith. Leap of faith that something could sustain me when I stopped my way of doing things. And so for mine, if I don't interject, if I don't control, if I don't make my will, this whole thing is going to go to shit. Excuse me. But that's what's going to happen. It's all going to fall apart. I'm the only thing that's holding my family or my life, or my work, holding it together. Well, that's a lot of pressure on one person, first of all. And secondly, it's not true. They all seem to do just fine. I mean, there's a reaction and ripple effects in our family for sure, because I had held a certain spot. Count on me to make sure that if that didn't get done, I would do it. I don't finish my project, my mom will finish my project. But aligning my life with God's and going through scary places in recovery is faith working in my life. My son was first in the hospital going through the withdrawal thing, and that is most anxious that I've ever seen him tried to convince me he should just be able to come back home. Um, treatment for him. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I me. I've been prepared for that because when it had already been working with him, I already talked to Todd and I about what we, you know, what he was going to say, what was going to happen. No, it was not. Stuck with what I said. No, nope. Daddy and I said, no, nope, you, you can never come back here and work with us. Never. You violated all that, all that stuff. And until you go to this program, Right? right, he got ninety days in the.
working but living with men who were in the sober living situation. So we had more practice. Kind of. um, It was the longest 10 days almost of my life. Not only did I feel responsible that he was a drug addict, <laughs> somehow, some ways my control had created this, even though I spent most of our time talking about why we didn't hang out with Grandpa Bob. Right? That we had a lot of those conversations in my life. Why don't we see Grandpa Bob? People see Grandpa Bob because he's. It did not become my grand my dad. It become my grand. Um, and I was two years into my priesthood, or three years into my priesthood. So there was that too. Anyway, steps four and five: courage and integrity. Uh, Note the word fearless in the fearless moral inventory, which is faith and fear, it says, do not coexist. I always I hold on to that Bible verse a lot in my life. It takes courage and integrity to look back at unflattering moments and share them with another person, and to overcome my fear and become vulnerable and present my true self is the basis for a real relationship. That's hard to imagine, judging that I've done of other people. Right now, with that same broad stroke, it is the willingness, is willingness. It's a whatever it takes clause in the contract with God and being ready to go. Because until then, until I recognize that whatever I think I'm receiving is not as healthy as not receiving. But it is familiar. Now, um, when we behave in certain ways, I'm going to try to think of something. Else. So the reward, I guess I was talking about like doing things for my children that, that my, then I could be seen as being the perfect parent. That's what I got out of that. <laughs> and I have your duty to do that. You're, mm -hmm. a, you're the mother and you, and you love this child. And so I have to do this and if he dies, it's my fault. Yeah. And the other thing is to give in to children um, who are walking at their responsibility to take it on the future from having to go through the storm that they create. Yeah, and that's a good example. So in the treatment center where I work, yeah. Um families would bring in their loved one, whether it's a son or a spouse or whatever, and um, they would feel really good about it. They got them there and uh, and then the person is discharged maybe 30 days later and told to keep up with their AA. And so they go to meetings and all of a sudden we have a spouse coming in, a woman coming in for the codependent meeting saying, I've waited for 20 years for him to get in recovery. And now he comes home from AA meetings talking about Sally and Mary and Bob and all of these friends that he has. And, you know, I'm nowhere. All of a sudden, this person is not needed as much because the person in recovery, the alcoholic in recovery, is managing, beginning to manage his own life. And this person is like, well, no, we're like, he's not maybe. calling the boss yeah. anymore to tell him he's sick. Uh -oh. <laughs> and that's why it's a system. Alcoholism is a system. And that's why so many times I've served in two Episcopal churches where they were alcoholic systems because former rectors were alcoholics. 
And so they set up the system to support, defend, cover, codependency to allow that to function. Yes. Uh, I'm no, getting, you're not. I'm not getting what, what it really is. What's codependency? What I mean, I hear it all. Yeah. I really well, I think everybody in the room could probably, and I would love to. Take away your dignity by doing something I think you ought to do for you. Calling in sick for you <laughs> when you're too drunk. Like, I don't know. Well, and making up a story. called the neighbor. And they the same thing. Oh, it is okay. Yeah. Tom, a short, a short line that we use is when loving you is killing me. That's codependency. That's a good thing. So you get stuck in that, that type of steel. Oh, you absolutely. Keep doing it and keep yeah. yeah. All of us have mechanisms by which we function in relationship. This is not. There's not a perfection here. There, I, I hope I'm not saying that there's some other, there are ways we can be better about certain things. Uh, yes, but all of us, and then there, what, we, what we strive for, Tom, is interdependency, right? Interdependency. So I, and that was what was most powerful for me is one time I was reading the baptismal covenant, like we do six, seven times. Every human being. I realized that some of my behaviors were taking away someone else's dignity. And sometimes that dignity might mean I hear that, right? Better how to do this walk. And we create a lot of control <laughs> with the among the other people, just like you've been talking about. If I can just oh yeah. Okay, because my father always drank. There was not a moment when he got kicked out of Washington and Lee. Or drinking. That's right. You gotta drink a lot. <laughs> 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 kicked you out of well, he got, I mean, the, the drinking led to not going to class. Yeah. Oh, that might have been. Yeah. We had to go to Korea instead. Um, Allison, I think one, one thing that's hard to understand is that the codependent is just as sick, sometimes sicker than the alcoholic or addict or whatever problem is and so you know but I feel like we just to give a picture we, we start out in middle school being this half gal looking for the guy of our dreams and and oh good we found it we marry um what we have here are two half people and then enter addiction or codependency or financial problems or extramarital affair and this feels like flesh ripping mm -hmm. and so you know a good therapist or treatment center will try to do this but if the alcoholic begins to get better, this is the picture of the codependent coming like Pac-Man. And this relationship will not, cannot work. And that's what they just said. So which the ideal is this. Two people coming Yeah. Right. And do we, of course, are we worse at it when we're stressed? Yes. Do we revert to old patterns when things seem uncertain and stressful? Yes. So I will go back to what I said about family systems, and secret keeping. For me, that's just been the hardest thing to overcome. How do I tell the story without seeming pitiful, victim, shame. less than, shame? If I don't tell the story, then the secret stays where it was. And it begins to rule my life. I have no friends because I, I am terrified that I am going to say something that will mean my dad will be exposed. Lived a block from the courthouse. I don't know how anybody didn't know. If you went to the 
or the Alps or the <laughs> bar on the corner, he was there, right? So I don't know how you wouldn't know. Maybe they just thought it was. Schultz. Yeah. It was a Schultz. Yeah. He is a Schultz. He was a Schultz. I'm a Schultz. Yeah. The best yeah. person who knows how to keep a secret is the man that works at the ABC store. Or my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, your mother was invested in. in oh, my mother. And then she what became. About the, think about them. The guy who sold it to everybody. She became his secretary. All of that. She did not know how, and as much as she probably wanted him to be sober, I'm sure, to your point, Sharon, she did not know what to do when he was sober. And none of us did right. because he wasn't in a program. He was just a dry drunk. And we would all wish that he would just start drinking again. Because he was mean, spiteful. We didn't even want him around him. So that's not sobriety. No, no. He wasn't drinking. He was mean. Yeah. Was he mean when he was drinking? Yeah. But you know, eventually he'd fall asleep. So he was mean when he drank. And he wasn't at home. He wasn't home. So you didn't have to be a part of it. The secret keeping is such a big part of this. And that. Yeah, it does. And why is that anonymity about AA so important? It's like, you know, I don't want anybody to know. I go no, to it's, not, it's not about not wanting anybody to know. It's about them taking not responsibility. Not exposing somebody. Not exposing someone. They can tell whoever they want. Uh, yeah. That's not true. You don't go to tell the kids who I saw at AA. No. So never believe. Ann Austin <laughs> was at AA tonight. You know, yeah. Ann Austin. Yeah. yeah. You go and that's what they're doing. I mean, even when Todd and I went to Al Anon meetings, there were people from my parish there that I had no idea whose spouses and children were in recovery or not in recovery, as the case may be, because their health was important to them. Most of their spouses or other significant. We went to Al Anon so that they could tell me how to stop right. this other person from drinking. Yeah, we went there for that. that we went yeah. there for that. Right. I was wrong. We all start there. I was wrong. And they yeah. just said, come six times because you don't have it right now. No. So come at least six times to get it. That's exactly right. Because I still felt responsible for my son's drug problem. Todd still felt responsible. Mm -hmm. What did he have not done as a father that would allow this to happen? How did we not see? It was happening in our own home. And we live in a two-bedroom. What had we been overlooking just because I was too busy being a new priest or whatever I whatever I had contributed to that? So uh, so let's say this person goes to recovery. And that, I understand that AA hey, hey, never, you know, you're still, you're always, so now now you're always an now now. Yes. So you, you're never going to get away from it? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you practice the 12 steps, no. I can't, I can't, God can let them. That's step one, two, and three. Yeah. I think the 12 steps are appropriate for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you have kids yeah. or not. They are. And so to your point, sure. So the first three steps are connections. Steps one, two, and three are about connecting God or higher power. Uh, steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine are about correction. Those middle, how could this be different? Love that. I heard that somewhere this week. Kind of sitting here the whole time. There's several of us here that are involved in the circles program. And I don't think it's an addiction, poverty. 
but um, but there's a lot of parallel with here. It's certainly, it's certainly got a codependency aspect to it. And only the person in poverty can get themselves out of poverty. Mindset to some degree, and all of that. Things I'm going to be interested to kind of think this through in light of the circle aspect. I think there's a lot of connection. I mean, it's a yeah. deep, it's a, I think there's a lot more uh, behind poverty, race, all kinds of so institutional things. Sure. That's, that's what I'm saying. I know, yeah. you know. And, and I'm not trying to. I'm not sure. That, I'm not trying to say these are the things. Same, right. but I think the underlying way you get out is probably got a lot in parallel. Yeah, it, it right. creates a mentality. Yeah. Where you see yourself, really. where you see the world, I guess. The way you think others see you. I, yeah. That's this is, uh, that's a key part. How we think others see you. There's a priest, we may come this summer and Hope, and I was lucky that uh, he's retired, but he's amazing. I um, I took theology. Trust me, that was not the way I went. I thought I probably, which I probably needed it, but I didn't. I went and I took three classes with Stuart on alcoholism to sort of understand it to get a grip on it. And that when I did my clinical pastoral education, uh, I worked at the Brooklyn VA. And I put me with intake alcohol. And then I found myself yelling at some Korean vet and saying it's going to be dry and that, you know, it's never going to drink again. I know we're done with this. There's some buttons. So, um, if coercion does coercion doesn't work, that attraction does. And this may be too basic or stupid, but how does one other than God get to attraction? Well, by living, seeing people's lives changed. <coughs> it's in your own story. And it's like, see, that's what happens when you go to AA meetings or Al Anon meetings or any kind of meeting, there'll be some speaker. The speaker is not trained, in, in, they're not the master of the universe, they're nothing. They stand up and they say, Hello, my name is Allison and I'm a codependent. I tell a piece of my story. That's it. That's it. And it's anything, they applaud at the end for your courage. And then you sit down. Yes, I was thinking, yes, if the person doesn't go to AA. No. How does well, they then, they, then they meet someone or someone meets yeah. them and tell. And, you know, this this is so much bigger. I think, Nora, maybe that was one of the well, things she's, oh, she probably is. that she was making. But this is way bigger than alcohol and codependency, y'all. Mm -hmm. and, and if you, uh, the best source is. Is the last one on Alex's page, Breathing Underwater by Richard Rohr. Yeah, amazing. Um, we have some copies. It's um, the only Richard Rohr book I ever understood. But, um, <laughs> That's because you understand the quotes. Oh my right. golly. Yeah. Every sentence. Mm -hmm. and, and I did a group here, Allison, for two years on, on that book. And I, if there was interest, I would do it again in a skinny minute. Good. Yeah. I would do it every Monday morning with, um, with Marty. Yeah. Marty <laughs> There's another book on here, so I would recommend too that's not necessarily about the 12 steps, but is about the 12 steps. And this is the dental right above that. Belong. Bonds of Healing and Recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis and uh, Sheila Lynn and uh, it's a brother, sister, and a, the spouse of one of them. Mm -hmm. I've written the book Holding What Gives You Life, the Sleeping with Bread book. Uh, Good Goats and Bad Goats, Healing What has broken you. Um, this bonds of it's, it's their take on the 12 steps. Uh, so it, it is also a helpful book to read. Now, I've done a class where I did a step a month with people. Mm -hmm. 
just to sort of really explore, bring people in to talk about their experience with the first step mm -hmm. and their experience with the second step and so on. And that, that was powerful. That was powerful. But it requires a lot of trust. I don't know where to think about all of this. Do I, you know, I try to say the serenity prayer when I think when I realize I'm Have a house? Huh? Do I have a house? Yep. No. <laughs> so that'd be great. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. What also is so um, hey, hey, cool. Um, I have a granddaughter who's a, a drug addict, and um, she went to rehab, but she was sick. Um, her mother, who has been in the for her all her life. I've tried to get her to get out of because I feel like Alan and I can learn how to, what not to do. I mean, I had to deal with it. Yeah, and there's that thing you hear that phrase about hitting bottom, you've heard it, you know it. And everyone's bottom is different, mm -hmm. right? And it could just be my own frustration with how I can't see, see my way through something. Right. Uh, so, yeah, right. So everybody, you know, it doesn't mean everything has to be. You have to be on the curb with a cup in front of you in order to be a bottom. It could just be that you've decided that this is as far as you want to go. <laughs> Thank you all for your attention this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Letting me share something about that shaped me. All right, that's so.